This is a production of Cornell University. Wonderful. All right, so I would like to thank you all for being here today. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the research I've been doing, looking at the stabilization and degradation dynamics of extracellular DNA in soils, and specifically how those dynamics are impacted by agricultural management and habitat type. So the first question you might have is, what is extracellular DNA? So extracellular, or eDNA, is any DNA strand that's not contained within a cell. And in soils, as in other natural environments, um, eDNA arises when the DNA inside of a living cell is either actively secreted, or more commonly, a cell will die, it will lyse, and its cellular contents will spill out into the environment. Um, and in soils, eDNA is important for a variety of reasons. Namely, it's an important source of nitrogen and phosphorus, so it's important for nutrient cycling. It's an important structural and functional component of bacterial biofilms. And um, it's a, a key player in horizontal gene transfer. But for the purposes of this talk, we're really concerned about the potential that eDNA presents to introduce bias to our estimates of microbial community structure. So this question has really risen to the forefront in recent years due to the increasing accessibility of high throughput sequencing. And for those of you who aren't familiar with this method, the basic workflow is that you take a sample, you can extract the total DNA from that sample, which will include both intracellular and extracellular DNA. You can amplify a gene of interest and then directly sequence those amplicots. And under the sequencing conditions that we use in the Buckley lab, we expect between tens and hundreds of thousands of sequences per sample. So that's a lot of information, right? Um, and as we analyze that information, one of the key assumptions that we're making is that every DNA sequence that we see derives directly from a living cell. So the idea is the cell is present in the soil, it's alive and well, you kill it when you extract its DNA, and then you can draw direct comparisons between your sequences and the living cells in the soil. But eDNA violates that key assumption, mainly because the cell from which eDNA came might have been dead for a long time, but that eDNA remains stable and sequenceable in the soil. And you can't tell those apart, right? So the areas of eDNA research where there's general consensus is that eDNA can be stabilized on soil minerals, specifically clays and to some extent sands, um, and also on soil organic matter. Um, that eDNA can persist over long periods of time, and that it can make up a really large portion of the soil DNA pool, generally on the order of like 20% to 80%. So it's not insubstantial. Where we lack consensus, however, is when we start to ask questions about the extent to which eDNA is introducing bias to our estimates of microbial community. So there was a paper that came out last year where they took a reagent that targets specifically extracellular DNA, they treated soils with that reagent to remove eDNA, and then compared the sequences from the treated soils to the untreated soils. And what they found is that there was a significant eDNA-driven bias in terms of bacterial richness, diversity, and community structure. So for microbial ecologists, this is big news and it's bad news. Because if that's always true, it means that the work that we've been doing for years has this unaccounted for source of bias. Bad. But there was another paper that came out last year also where they used a similar technique but a different reagent, so comparing treated and untreated soils, and they found that regardless of the size of the eDNA pool, so even when it was like 80%, there was still no significant eDNA-driven bias. So what's a researcher to think, right? We have these two really well-respected labs telling us completely contradictory information. And so as a way to wade into this conversation, I wanted to test the hypothesis that the degradation dynamics of eDNA, which will influence eDNA-driven bias, um, vary across gradients of both agricultural management and also habitat type. And so to start with, I needed soils from a management gradient. And so I chose to use samples from a long-term corn trial that's been running in Chasey, New York, which is like way up in the North Country. And this is a multi-decade study where they've been applying factorial combinations of intensive tillage, no-till, corn biomass removal, and corn biomass return. 
So this has resulted in a really clear management gradient that's accompanied by a really clear soil organic matter gradient. And then for my habitat gradient, I chose to sample more locally. This is Monkey Run, and right here in Ithaca, New York. And I collected samples from agriculture, meadow, and forest soils at that site. And so as I was testing this hypothesis, I was also bearing in mind two sort of follow-up questions. The first of those is what is controlling the degradation and stabilization dynamics of eDNA and soils? And the second of those was over what time scale do we expect any eDNA-driven bias to be apparent? So to try and answer these questions, I performed a series of laboratory microcosm experiments where I put some soil into a microcosm, and then I added a synthetic eDNA marker. So this is real DNA made of nucleotides, but it was synthesized in a way that I designed. So this marker contains two different sets of primer sites that allow me to do two different types of analysis. So the first of those, shown here in green, here and here, well, white at least, um, is a uh, high throughput sequencing appropriate primer site. So it's, it uses, um, or it will be targeted by um, universal bacterial sequencing primers. The other primer site that I built into this synthetic eDNA um, were primer sites that are specific only to this gene, right? This is, these are primers that we don't expect to um, amplify anything else in our soils. So I add my soil and my eDNA. I allow my microcosms to incubate, and I periodically collect subsamples of those. And then from each of those subsamples, I collect total DNA or extract total DNA. And again, this total DNA will, con will contain both any DNA that was natively present in the soil, but it will also contain however much of my synthetic eDNA gene is still present. So I have my total DNA. And then using those, or taking advantage of those two different primer sites, I used two different types of analysis on the same DNA. The first of those was an eDNA marker specific quantitative PCR. So this is a technique that will measure only the synthetic eDNA gene. It's not telling me anything about the rest of the community. The second technique that I used is high throughput sequencing, the technique I was describing earlier. And this technique is going to tell me not only about how much of the synthetic eDNA is present, but also about what that looks like in the context of the larger bacterial community from the soils. So let me show you some results. So starting off with, these are the qPCR data from the management gradient. And we have here on the, the y-axis the amount of eDNA that remains in the sample. And then as we move across the x-axis, we're moving through time. The first thing we note is that between time zero and day seven, so that's a one week interval. And I wanna point out that this is a log scale on the y-axis. So what we're seeing in that first week is a two to three order of magnitude decline in the amount of eDNA marker that's still present, followed by relative stability across the rest of the experiment. So to better understand these data, I fit them using a nonlinear least squares modeling approach with a Weibull type mortality curve. So this type of, of curve has three parameters. It has a starting value parameter, so that's sort of up here. It has a decay rate parameter, which is sort of going to be in here, and then an asymptote parameter. And the nature of the model allows us to compare those parameters between treatments. And I want to stop here and say that the starting quantity parameter is the same across all of our data and all of our data sets, which is by design, so we feel good that that was the result we got, right? We wanted to start with the same amount. So where we're really looking for differences, is in the decay rate term and in the asymptote or the stabilization term. And what we see for our management data is that first off, we were not able to detect any differences in the decay rate terms between treatments. And I want to sort of drive home at this point that that two to three order of magnitude decline in eDNA in the first week um, means that you know, we didn't, there was a lot of degradation that was happening that we didn't capture sufficiently. So, it's really coarse resolution. And what that means is that there might be differences in decay rate that we just aren't able to see because of the coarseness of our time frame sampling. But what we are able to see is a difference in stabilization between treatments. So we found that stabilization was significantly different and um, greater under no-till management than it was in our tilled samples. So no-till management is resulting in greater eDNA stabilization. 
So the next set of data I want to show you is the high throughput sequencing data from the same management gradient, right? So these are the same tubes of DNA being <coughs> analyzed in a different way. And you probably noticed that this looks a little bit different. Um, we're still looking at the amount of eDNA that's present on the y-axis, and we're moving through time on the x-axis. We're still seeing a two to three order of magnitude decline in that first seven days, so that's all consistent. But what's really different about the sequencing data versus the qPCR data is that with, with the qPCR, we were able to detect the eDNA marker in every sample at every time, whereas with the high-throughput sequencing, at time well, seven days here, we start to lose the ability to see that eDNA in some of our samples. So all these samples that are sitting right down here on the, um, the x-axis, those are samples where we were not able to detect the eDNA. And the samples where we were able to detect the eDNA up here are inching really close to this horizontal line, which represents our estimated limit of detection for high-throughput sequencing. So essentially, high-throughput sequencing is a less sensitive method and so we, even early on, we start to lose the ability to detect that eDNA. And as a result of this lack of sensitivity, we weren't able to detect any differences between treatments at any time, which is in sharp contrast to the qPCR data where we were able to detect differences between the tilled and the no-tilled soils. So I want to sort of pause and really drive home that point about differences in sensitivity, namely that qPCR is a much more sensitive method of detection than high-throughput sequencing. And that that difference in sensitivity is going to impact our ability to see eDNA-driven bias. So method sensitivity is going to matter. All right. So I'm going to bring us back into the data now. And I'm going to show you the habitat gradient data plotted and modeled in the same way as the management data. <coughs> so again, we're seeing a two to three order of magnitude decline in the first week, um, followed by relative stability. We're still using that same model uh, modeling. We're looking for differences. In this case, we were able to detect a difference between decay rates, namely in that the decay rate of the forest soils was significantly different from and slower than the decay rate of the meadow soils, right? So forest has slower degradation than meadow soils initially. But by the end of the experiment, it's the meadow soil that has significantly more or significantly different um, and more stabilization than either the agriculture or the forest soil. So there's this decoupling, right, between initial degradation and stabilization and long-term degradation and stabilization. All right. And then when we look at the sequencing data for those same tubes, we're seeing very similar things to what we saw with the management data. Right? We're still able to detect the eDNA standard at time zero in all of our samples. We're still seeing a two to three order of magnitude decline in that first week, <coughs> and we're starting to lose the ability to detect the eDNA in those samples with our sequencing method. And again, we couldn't detect any differences between treatments with our sequencing data. Okay, so pause there, bring it back to this hypothesis that I was testing. I was testing whether or not eDNA degradation dynamics would vary across gradients of habitat and management. And as far, oop, that was not what I wanted to do. Um, so I demonstrated that those do both impact eDNA degradation dynamics, right? So both tillage being part of management and habitat influence stabilization in the long term. All right, so the follow-up question that I was asking was what's controlling eDNA degradation and stabilization dynamics? And so to try and get at this question, because remember, I, in the management gradient, I saw this, there was a really strong soil organic matter gradient that went along with that management gradient. And so soil organic matter seems like a really good place to start, right, when looking for the underlying controls. So I plotted, um, or I looked for a correlation between soil organic matter that I'm using percent carbon as a proxy for, with the amount of eDNA that was still present at one week. So this is after that initial precipitous decline. And what we see is that there is a strong positive correlation between soil carbon and initial eDNA stabilization. And that this correlation is strongly significant. So that's cool, right? That tells us that soil organic matter is playing a role here. But interestingly, when we look not at initial stabilization, but rather at longer term stabilization, so by the end of the experiment, that correlation completely disappears. 
So this again drives home that point that there is a decoupling between initial degradation and stabilization and long-term degradation and stabilization. All right. So the second follow-up question that I was asking was over what, oh, I'm sorry. What, the first question was what's controlling those degradation dynamics? And what that decoupling is telling us is that we're pretty agreed that DNA is entering the soil as eDNA. Something happens, and then some portion of that eDNA that enters the soil might ultimately be stabilized. But we have a lot of questions about how much of the eDNA gets stabilized, over what time scales, by what, um, uh, what method. And so our results suggest that when eDNA enters the soil, one of the controls between entrance and stabilization is soil carbon, right? So it's having an impact on what kind of proceeds on this pathway towards stabilization. But our, our results also tell us that soil carbon isn't the only thing controlling this, right? There are some other processes or set of processes that are controlling whether or not the eDNA that enters the system is ultimately stabilized. So now, that second question I was asking is over what time scales do we expect eDNA-driven bias to be apparent? So this figure is for illustrative purposes only, but what we're showing is that if we take the qPCR data, where we were able to detect the eDNA in all samples at all times, and we overlay that sensitive method data with the limit of detection of our less sensitive high throughput sequencing, which is a more common technique and in many ways more informative. What we're looking for is the time that it takes after eDNA addition for the amount of eDNA to drop below that high throughput sequencing limit of detection, which you can sort of think of as a veil line, right? The DNA might still be present, but once it's below that limit of detection, you can't see it anymore. So it's not impacting your results. And this figure shows us that with a treatment that has really slow degradation, the time that it takes between the, when the eDNA enters the system and when it drops below that veil is going to be longer than in a really fast degradation treatment where that, that time will be shorter. Right. And this is going to have implications for, like, practical implications for sampling, right? If you are doing time course sampling and you are concerned about will my results be biased by eDNA, these are going to be important numbers for you to think about. So let me show you um, the numbers that I got. And I want to point out at this point that I did this sort of analysis for the um, habitat data as well as for the management data down here but that I also looked at the impacts of moisture and temperature, which were not data that I presented today. Um, but across all of these different treatments, we're seeing a pretty wide range of, you can think of it as sort of the delay between when the eDNA is added and when it disappears. The shortest time that we saw was a day and a half, and that was in a very high moisture soil. So that DNA was pretty much gone immediately. As compared to a really low temperature treatment, four degrees, where we're seeing that that eDNA sticks around above the limit of detection for nearly two weeks, right? So that's a big difference. This is telling us that differential eDNA degradation has an impact on how much bias we're seeing in our results. Okay, so the directions that I think this project should take in the future are first off to really explore that relationship between um, short and long-term eDNA degradation, right? We saw this decoupling between initial and long-term. And as part of that, it's going to be important for us to understand why we could see that tillage and habitat impacted long-term stabilization, but that soil organic carbon, which seemed like a really likely culprit, wasn't really driving that all the way through to the end. So what other processes are involved here, right? Is it aggregation? Is it mineralogy? Is it some other process or set of processes? And then in addition to answering those questions, it's going to be important for us to gain better resolution in that first week after eDNA addition. So it turns out that sampling after one week is a little too coarse, right? We missed a lot of information. So we want to address that, right? Go back and look at what that, what that data tells us. And then finally, uh, the experiments that I did are useful, right? We learned from them, we feel good about that, but it's also really important to note that they have their limitations. And one of the main limitations of this type of experiment is that I'm adding a whole bunch of eDNA at once, and then I'm watching that same eDNA marker degrade, right, and go away. But in natural systems, we see constant turnover 
of, um, of DNA of microbial biomass. And so that one-time addition isn't really representative of what's happening in reality. So how do repeated eDNA additions, which are more representative of what happens in reality, how do they impact degradation and stabilization of eDNA? All right. So to tie this all together, right, we had this controversy. How did we add to that? And so the things that I can say, you know, we might not be able to say whether or not we have, like, maybe all is lost, maybe all isn't lost. But what we can say conclusively is that it's highly likely that gradients of management and habitat and moisture and temperature will result in differential uh, eDNA driven bias in our results, right? So these gradients matter. Additionally, we're gonna need to use caution when we sample with really fine time point resolution because of that sort of delay between when eDNA enters the system and when it drops below our detection threshold. And then finally, the sensitivity of our detection method is going to matter. So it's not this really cut and dry, like we're all doomed or no, we're all fine, right? There's some subtlety there. And so I'd like to end by acknowledging my committee, Dan and Joe, who have both been instrumental in helping me organize and execute these experiments. Um, I'd like to thank the whole Buckley Lab for your humor and your patience, um, and a specific shout out to Rolly and Sam for their help with sequence analysis. I'd like to thank Dennis at the Statistical Consulting Unit, and I'd like to thank the funders. And if anyone has any questions, I will gladly take those. Yeah. What's the steady state concentration of DNA in the soil? Or the eDNA? My eDNA addition? Uh, no, the, what you would find in nature in various places, the ballpark things. So it's going to depend um, on the soil specifically, but generally we see between 20 and 80% of the total DNA will be eDNA. How about in, in picograms or femtograms? Or? Two micrograms per gram is sort of a maximum. Um, I had a question about the sample preparation. Can you get rid of eDNA by just using different preparation? Can you sort of subtract cells from eDNA? Yes, yeah, there are a few different methods that people try to use to remove eDNA or sort of segregate eDNA from intracellular DNA. Uh, the two studies that I talked about earlier, the first one used a DNA intercalating dye called PMA that didn't you know, remove the eDNA from the system, but prevented it from amplifying. Um, and then the second study that I discussed just used a DNAs that got the extracellular DNA. But yeah, some people will do cell separation. Maybe that. I just wonder again, <laughs> I'm just curious about the controversy between these two papers. It's quite a dramatic difference, right? right. And so I, I sort of like, did you look, like obviously you probably looked into the methods. Like did anything sort of, sort of struck you what could be different between these two, you know, methods? Is it just the method itself? It's an extraction? It's, you know, how they sample, where they sample? <laughs> yes, so tact is not my strong suit, so I'm going to try and be really diplomatic right now, which is to say that my immediate reaction when I read both of those papers was to start pointing out flaws in their methods. And I could do that, but it seemed more productive to rather than try and like tear down what people had done, to try and sort of add to the conversation. Um, but some of the methods that they use, specifically the, the DNA intercalating dye could be really powerful, but there's also, you're sort of like many, many steps away from nature at that point. Um, so there are always flaws in the methods. Um, and I think that, you know, as research into this eDNA driven bias increases, right? Like the more people who read these papers, we're like, oh crap, we're totally, you know, everything's messed up. Um, I think people are gonna really nail down the best way to address eDNA. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.